sign in and join. No. Okay, well, we have like two. I am now. Mine has um <laughs> Bert, you need help? No, I don't. Okay, ready? Yeah. You have to wait one more minute. Oh, I can move that. Oh. I didn't say that. So it is 7 o'clock on Tuesday, August 13th, 2019. Um, we are going to start our regular governing board meeting with uh, roll call. And all members are here, minus Ms. Frank. And we will now stand for the pledge. And please remember to stay for standing for a moment of silence. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. God, indivisible, thank you. This is O'Brien. I move that the governing board adopt the agenda. I second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Did everyone get a chance to, did we all? I didn't, I was, I was writing. Okay, so we can start with board reports. Ms. Tweedy, would you like to get us going on our first meeting of the school year? Sure. <laughs> well, welcome back everyone. And I was just going to, um, I wanted to thank, um, I, I was able to, I spoke with um, Senator Livingston uh, about possibly looking at some different ways and talking to the Auditor General about how class size is calculated on the Auditor General's report because it really doesn't reflect the number of students sitting in classrooms. So I think it's difficult to make district comparisons. And he brought these concerns to the Auditor General. And I did receive a call from the director there that uh, does the, uh, um, school spending report and we were able to talk about this problem and I really felt encouraged she's reaching out to the Department of the Arizona Department of Education to see what data is accessible and we discussed different ways that I thought maybe you could do the calculation and, and she said that they were going to try to calculate it differently this year but if not this year for sure next year so I think that's really promising and I, I'm hoping that the um, class sizes will be reported more accurately on that report in the future. So I just wanted to thank Senator Livingston and the Auditor General's office for listening to those concerns. I know a lot of teachers would like to see that fixed. Um, and I just wanted to say welcome back to everyone and hopefully everyone's having a good school year. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Reed? Um, welcome back. Um, I hope that the second week of school is going well. Um, Darcy, that was wonderful that you were able to do that. Thank you for advocating for the district that way and for, um, for the teachers. I know that's been a big concern that everybody's heard, so thank you for doing that. Um, Hopefully everybody enjoyed convocation. Um, every teacher, um, staff member that I talked to had wonderful things to say. So thank you so much, Dr. Galligan, and to your team for putting that on and um, for all the, the district office staff that were there cleaning up afterwards. Um, you guys knocked it out of the park. It was really wonderful. Um, all of the teachers felt like they really, going into um, 
their workshops with PLCs felt like that was a good foundation day um, where they could then launch from. So I think it was great. Um, hopefully it energized all of our um, all of our staff to get back to um to work and um, special shout out to Jenna for being an awesome MC with the games um, and that was it was really great every everything about it and thank you to CCB and all of our sponsors for helping us put that on um, the last couple of weeks I've done a lot of volunteering just in my mom hat capacity um, being on campus at Sonoran Foothills trying to help um, get everything going and if you haven't ever I, I, I don't know that parents totally understand the um, amount of work that goes into getting our schools ready to go for their kids on the first day, um, but I was just putting packets together, and I was putting packets together for hours and hours and hours and copying and answering questions, and um, then a, a new parent would come in, and then the whole office staff would have to stop and answer questions and do school tours. and. The amount of hats that our front office staff wears and our administrators wear before school starts is amazing. So thank you to all of you for staying late and coming in early um, to do all of that. You know, I was um, talking, you know, trying to do some logistics things for the first day um, with our front office team and um, the school secretary uh, messaged me back at eight o'clock and said, I just got home. <laughs> and you know, those, that's what, that's what they do. So thank you for going above and beyond for your students and for your teachers at your school. Um, and, and to the facilities teams, just making sure that everything looks beautiful and is ready for our kids. They, um, worked so hard too. Um, Dr. Finch had, um, he was able to brag about, um, our district at the North Gateway VPC meeting. And that was really cool because we had a lot of people in attendance that didn't have kids in school. Um, any longer. So it was an opportunity for them to learn about how amazing the district is um, in the area in which they choose to live. So I'm hoping that gives them some other things to brag about. And um, let's see, um, I had an opportunity to have lunch with a member of uh, Governor Ducey's staff a few weeks ago, and she was asking questions about our safety and security at our schools and wanting to know what Deer Valley was doing because that's a big concern for Governor Ducey for um, this next um, session. And when she heard about some of the things Deer Valley was doing, her eyes got huge. Um, so it's nice to know that we are on the forefront of um, you know, trying to keep our students as safe as possible while they're in our care. Um, and I think that sometimes we just walk past some of the different security features that we have or some of the different things that are in place because they're just normal to us. But there's other schools and other districts around the state that don't have that. Um, so I'm thankful for the decisions that previous boards have made to um, make our schools um, as safe as possible for our students while they're there. And then I just had one quick question um, for Dr. Finch. Um, when it comes to grading, there's been some discussion amongst some of the different parent groups um, about the standard-based grading versus traditional grading um, and just kind of when we're going to start doing the education about how that's changing. And I know that some of our schools are already doing standard-based grading. Um, and so I think there's just a little bit of confusion out there for parents. And I don't want to confuse them anymore since we're rolling this out next year. but. Hopefully we can start to um, answer some questions and make sure that they're understanding all of the right information and um, how their students will be graded. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. O'Brien. I'd like to welcome everybody back, all of our students and staff, and ditto on the convocation. It was incredible, and, and thank you for all the hard work that went into putting that on as well as um, I'm really appreciative that everybody all, all those that came in attendance um, I had an opportunity to go to our graphic communications department over the summer and I get a tour by mr. James and so I want to give them a shout out because they are copying it seems like hundreds of thousands of pages all summer long and working um, overtime to get that stuff done 
uh, Mr. James has a great um, a goal to have out get work from other districts and other businesses so that we're able to pay for the work we need to be done within our district, which is awesome. So kudos to that department for all the work that they've um, done over the summer. And um, I was able to join Mrs. Reed in that meeting with the, the governor's staff. And, and so we'll have some probably requests for Mr. Meglarino regarding uh, costs for some of the um, things we've done over the years to improve our safety. She was talking about uh, some research they'd done in another state. And I said, oh, you don't have to go to another state. You, <laughs> We have that right here in our district. She says, well... But they're they're like partnering with other districts to you know share what they're doing, and I said, yeah, we've been doing that for a while. So um, she's very interested in finding out what what more we're we're doing and have been doing. So um, I think that'll be a good opportunity to showcase showcase Deer Valley a little bit more. So um, I hope everybody has a, a really great school year. All right, I guess I'm not going to be able to you know, do my normal one. So I'm going to welcome everyone back and say thank you for our staff for attending that wonderful family reunion or your first family reunion. Um, I've been to about 12 schools after that and spoken to maybe 70, 80, 90-ish people. And the recurring common comment was, that was so cool. I haven't seen my friends from in blank amount of years and I got to see them. Or I've never seen their face. We get emails for years and I've never seen his face or her face. Now I know who I'm talking to and I said or talking about and they said well yeah not usually. But anyway so the the thread that um, that, that puts through the fabric of our district just ties us together so we're not always going to get along we're going to make mistakes everybody not on the same day hopefully anyway um, but we know that there's somebody that's going to help pull us through that and show us how to do it a little bit better so we have a safety net and that's called each other um, this year is going to be the most hashtag extraordinary year and I promise to uh, make sure that our board just um, is kept up to date with all the things that we're doing and another or requested another time I am going to request that we have um, a Deer Valley um, Academy again for us for our parents for our employees um, Jim what was the real name it's not Deer Valley Academy Deer Valley University Academy okay so we're secondary on that Deer Valley University because we have so many things that are coming down the pike now that need to be explained um, what subtle differences are and what the big differences are because people have explained it incorrectly in the past so I really feel that our community needs that um, coming up soon not saying tomorrow but definitely before this year is over the the actual like 2019 year is over because I know 2020 is is the year of vision but I want to make sure that we already have that in our pockets before we start that 2020. So anyway, welcome back. And I think Dr. Finch might have something to say. A couple things. Okay. Um, yes, also thanks to the team for um, the rally was was uh, exceptional, I think, as well. It, it was nice to get the family together. It's, I think the last time we did it was 16 years ago. So um, good job there from obviously Dr. Galligan was the one cracking the whip, making sure we're getting stuff done. So kudos to her and her team. There's about a dozen folks that were involved with the main plan, so good job. And as mentioned before, CCV, um, they let us let us use their facility for free, Woo. and so that was a plus. Um, and we uh, we have, did get survey feedback from our staff. We had great feedback, so that'll help us design the next one. It probably won't be next year. Oh, uh, but, but that's yeah, what they asked they, for. They were asking for it, but I, I would like it to be special, so. Maybe three to five years is kind of what I'm thinking. So, well, it'll there'll be a natural break where we'll think this would fit. So, it's um, never say never, but um, we, we are definitely uh, pretty proud of how it turned out. Uh, let me give a couple other notices for you. One is um, Wednesday. I think I'm up at uh, at the conversations with Kurt. You're up to be in the neighborhood. I'm checking out, um, and also we the pro statement that you. Put together for our bond and our MO, it 
was, I don't know which one is which, but one of them is 238 words, and it turns out it can only be 200. So we have to revise it, do a little trimming, and run it back through. So uh, we'll have it at the next board meeting, and then we'll run it down to make, catch the proper date. So good job, but it was just 38 words too long. We've already trimmed it, and it's ready to go, and still has the same message. But we'll work with, um, we'll send it out probably in a Friday update to, again, to give you a chance to work on it if, more if you want to change it. Uh, but we'll have to bring it back. Sorry. But like fun. That sounds like fun. So that's, uh, that's the latest. Um, just just want to say thanks again for uh, to the board as well for being at the rally and and uh, playing along with everyone and enjoying the festivities. Thanks. So whose turn is it? Dr. Galligan. Good, e good evening, President. Oh, Ford. real quick before before you start, could the new people that are sitting at the table, you knew this was going to happen, could you stand up and identify yourselves? <laughs> We'll start from the left because it is Left Handers Day today. <laughs> Just wanted to know for those that are watching from the live stream whose head that is. Go ahead, Heather. <laughs> Why, thank you. Now, Dr. Galligan, go ahead. President Ordway, members of the board, Dr. Finch, and guests. Tonight, um, Catherine Borgeson and I will share some information about our opportunities that students were able to participate in this past summer. Extended school year is um, for our special needs students. Uh, it is a service that we provide. As you can see on each of the slides, we've given you a, a bit of um, a, a number. It's kind of cool, an infographic that shares some of the information about the number of students who participated and the number of staff who participated. In extended school year, you can see that it definitely takes a village um, to come together for that particular program. President Ordway, members of the board, Dr. Finch, and guests, course extension programs offer high school students an opportunity to continue working toward proficiency in the standards if they are not passing a course by the end of the spring semester. Students who took advantage of the program were issued an incomplete for the course. The students continued working on the course material with a teacher in an in-person format to reach proficiency on the standards and earn a passing grade. Deer Valley a Unified School District, or Deer Valley High School, had 64 students who participated with five teachers and staff involved. 61 passing grades were earned by the students. Mountain Ridge High School had 61 students who participated with four teachers and staff involved. 53 passing grades were earned by the students. And Sandra Day O'Connor High School had 47 students who participated with seven teachers and staff involved. 44 passing grades were earned by those students. Geometry Honors was offered at Barry Goldwater High School for students who had completed Algebra 1-2 Honors successfully and wanted to get ahead in math. 33 students took advantage of this opportunity and 33 students passed Geometry 1-2 Honors. One teacher worked with the students during the five-week, 124-hour session. In an effort to provide flexibility in our student learning environment, the Pathways program offered free high school courses to our students and families. Deer Valley Pathways allowed our students the opportunity to accelerate their learning and recover credits in a face-to-face -face smaller classroom environment. This past summer, a wide variety of courses were offered in the afternoons and evenings at Barry Goldwater and Boulder Creek High Schools. The total number of courses available to students between the two pathway sites was 21. 19 teachers taught the courses with two social studies teachers teaching both blocks. 287 students enrolled with 94 of these students attending both block A and block B. This is very cool. 96% earned passing grades in their courses. A celebration from last spring also 
is that 58 seniors earned or recovered credit with DVUSD Pathways to successfully graduate this past May. We sincerely appreciate our school board's decision to provide this added flexibility in learning opportunities for Deer Valley students to either recover credit or get ahead in credits. Just a little more information, although this data you see right here encompasses both the two sessions last spring and our summer Pathways courses, you can see that the two homeschool campuses, Barry Goldwater and Boulder Creek, provide the greatest enrollment in, the, um, in Pathways, with Deer Valley High School being the next one. We anticipate that this program will continue to grow um, this next year. And then as well, you can see that our seniors, at least for the three sessions that we have had so far, are the largest group of students who attend Pathways courses, which makes sense because they're the closest to graduation. But you can see that we had students from all four grade levels who participated in Pathways courses. The Deer Valley Online Learning Program offered over 125 high school courses to high school students this summer. Students took the courses to, again, get ahead, recover credits for courses they had failed or repeated courses to improve the grade they had earned on their transcript. The summer online program is one of our most robust programs that supports many students in both get ahead and credit recovery courses. In addition, our seventh and eighth grade students who had earned a failing grade in one or more of their core courses this past, sum this past year were invited to attend our blended middle school summer school or they would have been retained. The program is a hybrid model in which students complete online coursework as well as meet with a teacher each week for face-to-face -face support. Students who successfully met the proficiency expectation were reassigned to the next grade level, so either eighth grade or ninth grade. We had 68 students take advantage of this opportunity and 62 of them were able to reassign to the next grade, either eighth or ninth grade. Bel Air offered a summer learning program for second through sixth grade students. 52 were involved with 11 teachers and one staff member serving the children. The students were provided free breakfast and lunch during the 15-day program. And we wanted just to share a couple of photos. Um, students were able to explore several engaging learning sessions, including literacy and art integration, and of course, the ever popular coding. The STEAM Gifted Rocks Summer Camp gave first through ninth grade students the opportunity to focus on science, technology, engineering, arts, and math during two weeks in June. 78 students took part in the camp. Most of the students were from Deer Valley Unified School District, but some came from other districts, charter schools, and homeschool. Six of our gifted specialists and Renaissance teachers facilitated the camps. Five regional sites conveniently located throughout the district provided school-age children in grades K through eight with educational, athletic, and social activities in a safe, positive environment this summer. Field trips, guest speakers, and arts and crafts were just a few of the elements that make these camps so much fun. 1,422 students were enrolled in the camps and 133 teachers and staff worked to provide a great summer experience for the students. During the Art Rocks summer camp, students worked on drawing and three-dimensional art projects centered around the theme of animals. As a culminating event, the students visited the Wildlife World Zoo. The camp was held at Center Day O'Connor High School for third through 11th graders. 35 students were enrolled in the camp and that was led by two teachers. During the Art Rocks pre-AP summer camp, uh, pre-AP drawing summer camp, students prepared for AP studio art by working to improve their skill in drawing in different medias with an emphasis on life drawing working from observation, rendering interiors, and other skills required for a successful advanced placement studio art portfolio. One of our high school art teachers taught the camp at Center Day O'Connor High School. 17 incoming seventh through 12th grade students participated in the camp. During the Theater Rocks summer camp, students prepared for and presented a stage production. 30 second through sixth grade students took part in presenting The Jungle Book, and 50 7th through 12th grade students were involved in presenting Shrek the Musical Junior. The Music Rocks Camp offered several different opportunities for students to expand their in instrumental or choral skills and culminated in a summer evening concert performance for family and friends. 
This camp took place at Deer Valley Middle School with 102 students participating and with seven teachers involved. Fifth through ninth graders participated in one to three weeks of the Summer Rocks Camp. Five Deer Valley Unified School District teachers led 174 students through sessions focused on STEM explorations, robotics, medical science, Jurassic animals and adaptations, forensic science, and space exploration. The American History Summer Camp allowed fifth through ninth graders the chance to focus on expanding their knowledge of the history of the United States of America. The camp was held at Sandra Day O'Connor High School and led by one of our district teachers. Nine students participated in this summer learning opportunity. We are grateful for our food services department who served free breakfast and lunch meals to children and adults at seven sites throughout the district this summer. All meals included a nutritious entree, fruit, vegetables, and ice cold milk. Children's meals were provided at no charge and adult meals were $1.50 for breakfast and three for lunch. An amazing 25,466 child meals and 852 adult meals were served this summer by 12 food services workers. We are very proud of the teachers and staff members who help make opportunities like this available for all children in Deer Valley. Thank you. Okay, trying again. Wow, Mrs. O'Brien. <laughs> anyway, um, could you, in an update, just send us a, a three-year comparison of the amount of meals that we've served? Absolutely. We'll have that um, in there. It's just a, a point of information because we can use that when we talk to different Absolutely. entities on what we're doing. Thank but you. thank you very much, and thank you, Mrs. Borgensen. This is Dr. Zerbeck's um, debut. You bet. I'm ready. All right, go ahead. Please take it away. Good evening, President Ordway, members of the board, Dr. Finch, and the community. It is the pleasure of the ALS Department to be here tonight to present uh, to you a state of the district report with respect to social emotional learning in our district. Uh, Mr. Warner and I are here tonight to provide a brief recap of what we accomplished last year in 2018-19 and also to give you a preview of what will come in 2019 and 20. For your convenience, the, there is a single document that has been provided to you which captures our strategies and our tactics uh, that we have used both last year and that we intend to use this year. That is the document as we will reference that at points uh, throughout the presentation. You can see on that single document that there were four primary strategies that we used and deployed in the 2018 and 19 school year. Starting with the first one, it was to increase suicide prevention awareness. Our second strategy was to secure additional human capital. Our third strategy was to investigate how technology could support us. And our fourth strategy was identification, prevention, and intervention. With respect to 2018-19, we are not going to cover all of these points because we have covered many of these with you uh, in the past. But just to highlight a couple of these, you'll notice that with strategy one, with our tactic of building community awareness, that that did seem to be an effective tactic that many community members commented to many members of the district that they appreciated the community conversations, that they appreciated the content that was delivered, uh, and many community members had also remarked that with respect to suicide prevention, it was the most uh, impactful uh, and effective presentation that they um, had attended. And so we look to continue those uh, this year and in coming years as well. And the second bullet point, just to highlight, is that we did start to uh, deploy some initial professional development to our secondary staff members across the district with respect to suicide awareness, and we look to continue expanding that out to other staff members this year. For strategy two, securing additional human capital support, this is a real victory for everyone, for the district and for the community. Uh, this was not a singular accomplishment by the ALS department. As you know, uh, this required a cross-departmental effort 
Uh, on the front end, we had Dr. Galligan, Dr. Chunis, Dr. McCusker. On the back end with Mr. Miglarino, Ms. Mock helping with the agreements, and of course with our great partner, Southwest Behavioral, we were able to work out an arrangement to have a wellness counselor at our five comprehensive high schools. And again, this is a real victory for everyone. So we, <clears throat> the strategy three was investigating how technology can help us, and so we took a look at a couple of the alerting systems that are out there, uh, Anonymous Alerts and Social Sentinel. Anonymous Alerts is an app uh, uh, that can be downloaded to any sort of uh, smartphone or tablet um, that allows for two-way anonymous communication between administration and, and a student uh, reporting any kind of uh, event. A so social Sentinel is a social media scrubbing uh, uh, device that, that will scrub uh, uh, everything except for maybe Snapchat um, and give us reports uh, based on and around our school, what's going on. What's the trouble for us with both of those systems is they're expensive, um, but we were able to, uh, we're in the final stages with anonymous alerts and we'll be able to probably deploy that very soon um, in our district it's, uh, and have that, uh, that program available to our students and our staff. Uh, we took a look at threat detection. Uh, two of the groups that we looked at, or two of the companies and programs that we looked at were Gaggle and Bark. Uh, Gaggle was very impressive. Gaggle ran a, uh, uh, a five-week demonstration for us and turned up numerous issues where kids were talking about uh, self-harm or making threats or uh, making or doing things that are inappropriate in, in, uh, uh, for school. Google, or, excuse me, Gaggle uh, scrubs our Google Drive and our Google emails that we have with our students. Uh, Bark is is less of a, of a, of a alerting uh, uh, software, uh, uh, less robust exactly is the way to put it. Uh, so uh, we, we didn't really consider uh, Bark. Again, the trouble for us with, with Gaggle, it's an expensive program, it's about $100,000 to deploy it for half of our district. Um, and so as you are no doubt aware, uh, that's, a, that's a big chunk of change for us to, to, to carve off. So we're trying to look for st strategic or, or creative ways to, to fund that one, because we, we really do uh, like what the Gaggle uh, group has brought us. Uh, just uh, one second. So the alerting systems that you're talking about are, are for the students to to report something. Yes, and you can report. Uh, there's there's all manner of kinds of reports that, that students can make. Everything from low level harassment to a school threat. Right. Um, and so the uh, the the issue. What we like about it especially is that it allows for communication between the administrator and the student. So you can have a, actually have a follow up conversation with someone who's reported something anonymously. Let's say someone's reporting bullying on a bus. Um, the administrator could follow up with the person who had reported it anonymously still to see if that bullying is still occurring after they've taken steps to try to address it. And that would be um, quick enough where if somebody thought that they saw someone or heard uh, someone that they thought was going to um, hurt themselves, that that would be a quick enough it's an, it's an immediate. It's an immediate alert. Um, it's an alert both to me and, and uh, Julie Frank in our office, but also to the administrators who've, who've been selected on the campuses. So there's all kinds of eyes on, on what's going on with the alerts. Okay, and then the, the other, the next part, the threat detection goes through something and takes away something. So could you explain that a little bit more? Well, it it's, it's, it's an algorithm where they, where they search uh, for keywords and key phrases and pictures and things like that. So, um, and then they search through it um, and give us levels of, of uh, severity, levels of threat or levels of severity. So everything from low level things that they're identifying, which often end up being like uh, school assignments. And so it just so happened that the algorithm caught that to the other uh, more significant stuff that deals with self-harm or threats of, of that nature. And, and where are we um, doing this? Like, what? What's being searched? Yeah, what's being, what's our, being our, our Google, our Google uh, uh, complex. So it would be the Google Drives and uh, any of the Google email that uh, the kids are using as part of our, our school-based platform. Okay, so it would be done at, at whatever's done at school is what we're looking yeah, to. Yeah, but it, it, it can capture stuff that happens outside of school if they're using the school's Google Drive, right. the school's cloud. But so, it would be yeah. a DVUSD something. Exactly, that, yes. Okay. I'm sorry, Mrs. O'Brien, did you? Yes, please, Ms. Reed. Sorry, just a comment. If we have parents or teachers that are out, out that are watching, um, Bark does have a personal app also um, that you can put on your child's cell phone. Um, I have it on all of my kids' phones, and so Oops. it's 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 great. It's a It's a great app to have, so it's... Yeah, it's wonderful. So I just wanted to mention that. And then one more question. So we haven't 
we haven't um, decided on this because we're figuring out costs and efficiencies for it. For Doctor, not an ominous alert we're moving forward with. Oh, we are. Uh, we're okay. able to it, it, so it's the threat detection it's that we're threat detection to that that really that's a that's a large amount of money for us to be able to find. So we have to be creative. Um, so we're looking at f all sorts of grants and funding that are all over the yes, place, possibly yeah, absolutely. to be that's, the... That's, um, that's really sort of job one for us this year to try to figure out a way to make that happen. Can I just follow up on the price? Did you say for Gaggle it was $100,000 for half of our district? About rough, roughly. So but what uh, it, it makes little sense for us to, to scrub the drives of second and third graders, for instance. Uh, uh, so what Gaggle's made an offer to us of... of, of based on like 16,000 students instead of the, our total population. So uh, that uh, ends up being about $100,000, give or take, um, for that, for the cost. And that's for a year? That's for a year, yes. Wow. Are they employing our former students that have graduated? Yeah. Well, well, Mr. Swain from Gaggles in the audience tonight, if, if you... Uh, <laughs> Probably a former Deer Valley student. Just wondering. <laughs> okay, so do it's we a good have product. more yep. for that? Mm -hmm. Tweety do. Okay. Well, that's an awesome report, and someday we'll have money. Yeah. Go ahead. So identification, prevention, and intervention. Um, so we are um, in the final stages of putting together the panorama surveys to, for identifying uh, issues that our, our students and staff are seeing as, as issues on campus. Um, for prevention, we've been using our drug detecting dogs. It's one of our, our, our tools that we use. Uh, we're trying to prevent um, bad behavior um, or dangerous behavior on our campuses um, with our drug detecting dogs. Last year, it was very much a, uh, we tried to be very visible with them so that everybody knew that we could use them and that, and that they, they were happening. This year, we, we think they'll still be visible, but we also want to make sure that we're using them effectively in searches in the parking lots uh, for our, our high school campuses. Um, and we put together drug diversion as a, an intervention tool. We know that kids engage and in, in make uh, dangerous behavior and make bad choices at school. And so we were able to um, uh, offer drug diversion for our first time offenders this past year. And the results from the drug diversion program, program you'll see momentarily. So this next slide, uh, we are not going to read to you. Again, it more or less recaps what we've been talking about, but it does provide a nice synopsis of many of uh, the steps that we took in the 2018-19 school year. Okay, so with drug diversion, Mr. Warner will now uh, give you some of the statistics from last year in terms of how we did. Well, you can see it. You can see the three-year trend for us in number of hearings for drug infractions. So we had. 116, 17, 145 in 17, 18, and 22 in 18, 19. Uh, if you look at the approximate number of hours uh, of lost instruction, typically a first time drug offender in 16, 17, and 17, 18 would receive the rest of the, the semester suspension from school, out of school. Um, and so our estimation is that there was about 6,000 hours of instruction lost in 1617, about 8,700 hours of, of instruction lost in 17, 18, and 1,300. Uh, only in 2018-19. Uh, so our drug diversion, the way drug diversion works is that uh, students typically, uh, before they received a 10-day suspension, recommendation for a long-term suspension. So now what they receive is a 10-day suspension. Uh, five of those days are held in abeyance, uh, provided that the student attends uh, one of our two drug diversion uh, programs that we offer. Uh, they have to attend with a parent or guardian. And uh, then we, th those programs give us proof of completion, which the student then takes back to school. Um, and the five days are then not, they, they don't have to serve their five days. If they don't make it to drug diversion, um, then they have to come back to school and serve their, their other five days. I have a, just a question where it says the approximate hours of lost instruction. Is that for um, on their home campuses or these are kids that do that, not take advantage of Vista Peak? That, that's, from, that's a home campus okay. estimation. Right. Looking at that, thinking they were girls. I have another. I have a question. This is O'Brien. Right. If I could ask you a question on that previous slide, on the number of hearings for drug infractions in year eighteen nineteen, do we not have? If you go to the intervention program, there's no hearing. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So not. So would it be ninety two plus twenty two? In eight, 1819 had a, a drug infraction, 
but because 92 of them took the that's correct yes. okay you just want to make sure I understand okay. it correctly. And the numbers Thank kind of line up to the years, years past in, in terms of it wasn't higher or lower, really. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. And Dr. Zerbeck, did you want to, you looked like you wanted to say something. You don't, okay. Go ahead. Um, a gentleman didn't really talk about the cost because um, there was a cost for the hearings before, and we think it's probably a wash. Um, I think that's what you told me earlier, correct, not? That's correct, um, yeah. Because the drug, drug diversion is not cheap as well. So we either pay a hearing officer or we pay the, the drug awareness and obviously we've made a choice as a district that we think drug right. awareness will actually be a long-term uh, better long-term support I don't know if you want yeah to that's that. actually how we were able to fund drug diversion is through our hearing uh, money that, that we didn't have to spend money on long-term suspension hearings we were able to use it as uh, for drug diversion mrs. Reed um, two quick questions and one of them you can follow up with later um, is fine um, so for the type of drugs that the kids are utilizing is that including alcohol and tobacco and vaping or is that just no this is this is uh, not alcohol tobacco or, or vaping okay so it's just drugs okay so can we get information on how many um, students fall into the second category of, of using those on campuses we, we can get you information it's not great information from last year because okay. our vaping uh, category was still under tobacco and okay. uh, that sort of thing. We can get you tobacco numbers from last year. Okay. This year we've changed our category, so we'll be able next year to provide you the, the actual e-cigarette and vaping uh, statistics. Okay, and then um, with uh, the drug diversion program, can we get information on uh, what the recidivism rate is if there are kids that have um, gone to the drug diversion program and then used later or if they're Thought. They've made better choices and get some follow-up information that way. Well, the recidivism rate for being caught at school mm -hmm. is very low. Okay. Uh, I can't speak to, you know, maybe what's happening in their lives otherwise, but yeah, the, the, the actual choice to be high or bring drugs to school um, is very low. Okay. Like less than five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Don't you love being interrupted? Oh, great question. Go ahead. Okay, so that takes us into now 2019-20. In the current school year, there are five primary strategies that we will deploy. Again, you can see those on the reference sheet. Uh, those five strategies are the following. Uh, strategy one is to develop the five-year plan. Strategy two is to increase the use of our district resources. Strategy three, deploy the additional human capital supports. Strategy four is to continue the identification, intervention, and prevention. And strategy five, is the deployment of the actual technology resources. Okay, so specifically on strategy one, uh, with respect to the development of the five-year plan, we learned from our brothers and sisters in the Mid-States Consortium that many of them were using the Castle Institute to inform them of their practices with respect to social emotional learning. Uh, this is an institute that is located in Illinois and they really do have a plethora of resources uh, to help schools, to help districts uh, make planning uh, and make advances with respect to, again, the social emotional learning. In particular, they have rubrics both at the district and the site level that we uh, believe we will use to take a baseline assessment as, as far as where we are right now. Uh, we hope to accomplish that by the end of this first semester and then to have the concrete action plan uh, by the end of the year. And I can send those to you as well if you'd like to see those rubrics. Of course we would. As far as strategy two, again, the essence of strategy two is to capture what we currently have and to refine it and make it even better. And so one of the ways that we did that is we looked to merge our federal programs within the ALS department. As you are aware, various departments in our district, some have different functions with respect to SEL. And so this was one of the things we wanted to do is reduce any silo effects that may be happening. And so we would have our PBIS coordinator, our social worker to come closer and to work with uh, Mr. Warner and Ms. Miranda in federal programs to maximize uh, the, the efforts that are being had within those uh, departments. We also look to increase our collaboration uh, with student support services and curriculum and instruction and assessment. Again, each of those two, they do have uh, functions with respect to this. And so we look to make sure that we're meeting frequently and that the communication is open uh, as far as what's happening. So we're very excited to announce that all five high school wellness counselors started the year on their campuses. Uh, we're very excited about that. It was very cool. Um, 
And uh, we are still continuing to work with ASU and AmeriCorps to try to place uh, interns on campuses so they can be another trusted adult who's being part of a campus life. And um, we have hired our PBIS coordinator. Uh, we, our PBIS coordinator was, was uh, promoted to an assistant principal past, last year, and so uh -huh. we've been able to yeah. uh, recruit and hire a new one this year, and she starts on Monday. And we're very excited to bring her aboard to be part of uh, this SEL, P SEL PBIS process. Question. Um, you know, instead of saving it for the end, because then I forget. No, I don't forget, but it makes more sense. Uh, will the interns from ASU and AmeriCorps be working with the social workers, the wellness? They could, although we, we're looking to, to maybe deploy them at, at uh, campuses that don't have a wellness Oh, so counselor. not at the high schools. Not but necessarily at the high schools. But no, wherever yeah. else the need yes, would be? Yes, exactly. Okay. That's, that's, that's very exciting. Thank you. So part of the, uh, the so strategy four, looking forward, uh, we're gonna implement that panoramic survey. Um, we're gonna continue doing our drug detecting dog visits uh, and, and expand the number of times that we were on campuses. We want to continue with drug diversion and we wanna add a vaping and e-cigarette education diversion uh, program. And we're working with one of our um, drug diversion uh, groups to put something like that together that we can offer to uh, campuses uh, as, as maybe an alternative to the first time vaping sentences they're receiving right now. So we're going to continue to work and buy and install anonymous alerts for this year. Uh, we've, we've identified enough funds to make that happen. Um, and so as I mentioned before, we're going to work to identify additional funds for our, our digital detection tools. Um, uh, specifically Gaggle is, is what we'd like to bring into to Deer Valley Unified School District. And that concludes our report. Oh, I have a question for Ms. Tweedy. Ha, it's not mine. Are, are you still going to continue to just have the dogs out in the parking lot? Are you bringing them on the campuses? Absolutely. We, uh, we, we don't want to make them invisible to campuses, but we also want to make sure that they're working for us, too. So we want the kids to be able to see that the, that the dogs are on campus, but also the dogs are able to complete the searches that they want to do. So we, we think that we... We'll be able to have them on campuses more often this year, so we can have we can split their time a little more effectively. Still, just going to be limited to the parking lot. Well, that's our plan currently. Uh, they they have capabilities of doing all kinds of different searches. Uh, I'll be working with the Littleton uh, uh, School District. They they actually do classroom searches with these same dogs, and so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, how that's accomplished for them and and, and looking at something that we might be able to do in the future. But we don't have current plans for that. Okay. Mrs. O'Brien? Um, this is probably a little bit into the weeds, but last year the high school teachers received PD on um, initial suicide awareness. Are there plans to have our seventh and eighth grader, eighth grade teachers receive that same PD any time in the future? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we have our pre-K-12 meeting on uh, Thursday, and uh, I'll be pushing that uh, uh, PD out to our um, all of our K-6 and K-8 principals so that they'll have a PowerPoint that they can present to their, uh, their staff. So we, we, we're saying they can go down as low as fourth grade teachers because we think it's important that, that, that everybody has, understands those signs. Thank you. That's awesome news. And then last on the um, related to the, the drug diversion, um, many of us who have a few more years on us uh, remember D.A.R.E., and um, I <laughs> got to participate in a webinar where they have um, revamped their, their D.A.R.E. program. Is that something you've heard anything about or something we might look at in, in educating our, our children, our students about drugs? Uh, but sure, that's, that's always, it's always a, a possibility. I was, I was a former uh, you know, captain in charge of D.A.R.E., so I, I, I liked D.A.R.E. before. So, uh. Okay. I like that they're ad adapting to the statistics uh, from, from before. It wasn't as success successful as I hope it would be before, so now they're trying to revamp, the, as you say, revamp the program. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Public comments, and we have one. Public comments? Mr. Bob Say, if you can 
come to the podium and the board invites public comment on the district's business in general and on any agenda item in specific. Speakers are limited to three minutes. To accommodate all speakers within the 30 minute overall limit, the board president may shorten speakers' times. Vulgarity, disruptive conduct, or remarks disrespecting employees by name will not be allowed. The governing board cannot discuss or act on any items not listed on the agenda. Board members may respond to criticism, ask staff to review a matter, or request a future agenda item. And if you could just state your name for the record, sir. Sure. Uh, my name is Bob Say. The spelling on the last name is S-A-I. I can't say why. Uh, my wife and I live in uh, Stetson Hills. Uh, we've been uh, full-time residents of Stetson Hills. house uh, for the last uh, four years plus. Um, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak to you, uh, board members, uh, Dr. Finch and staff. Um, I can be brief tonight. I, I'm, I'm going to raise a topic that I think some, uh, perhaps uh, most all of you are aware of. Um, living in Stetson Hills last Friday, my wife and I and our 900 best friends are Hudson Hills community were informed by email uh, about a proposed development uh, that would, if approved, uh, be constructed directly in front of San Sandra Day O'Connor High School. This development would include uh, on the north portion of the, of the parcel some 325 uh, apartment units, uh, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom. Uh, there would be parking uh, provided for some 600 cars. Uh, that's only half of the development. The other half of the, of the development, this would be the frontage along Happy Valley Road, would include uh, retail uh, development. That's unspecified as yet, but perhaps you've seen the signs that are already are in place on this uh, particular parcel. The parcel is at 35th and Happy Valley. It's owned, uh, I understand, by the Peterson Group. The Peterson Group, long active in development in the Phoenix area and probably other places as well, it's a, it's a name that's familiar to me, and I'm a, I'm a relative newcomer to, uh, uh, to this area. Um, but it is uh, big plans, big thinking. It is just at the proposal stage now. There will be an informational meeting, as you probably know, on August 20th, and that meeting is, uh, is scheduled for Sandra Day O'Connor High School, um, and at that time, uh, uh, residents in the area, not just Stetson Hills. This, uh, this really in includes a number of communities that uh, region of Sandra Day. Um, uh, but these, in, uh, these people have, have received notice of this, of this development, uh, are invited to this informational. On August 20th, on, on August 20th the, uh, at the high school, it'll be just a one-hour informational turnout is. Uh, just judging from uh, some of the traffic that I've seen in the online community next door for our area, which is a rather large one. Uh, there is awareness of, of this. There is, I think, a desire to learn more about it, so I would expect attendance to be, hope, fairly good um, on, the, on the 20th at Sandra Day O'Connor High School. Um, uh, the concerns that I've seen online, uh, the concerns mentioned to me briefly by neighbors under them are what you would expect. Security, uh, traffic density that's, that's proposed for this development, the way it all would impact on Sandra Day O'Connor High School, but also in that immediate neighborhood and then beyond that neighborhood. I can't tell you the number of times that uh, traffic on Happy Valley Road came up in online comments about this particular development, pretty much in the context of. It's the last thing we need, more traffic on Happy Valley Road, which uh, has problems handling traffic at, at different times of the day. Um, uh, but with uh, the number of vehicles, the, the, the speed of the vehicles, and accidents which have happened, uh, uh, more frequency than uh, perhaps. Uh, so, so, um, so that is a concern that I'm speaking on behalf of myself, of course, but uh, again, it's proposed uh, just fair that uh, there is concern that I see. I'm just here on my own. Sure. And, and we appreciate that, but you're kind of like way over your time, so if you have just one more sentence you want to say. Um, 
This is not the only development that might affect Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, is, is Sandra Day O'Connor's attendance area all that community to the <coughs> northeast of the school, behind the school and northeast of the school? Uh, I, the community sometimes has a name of East Stetson Hills. Um, it's the community, uh, 35th mm -hmm. Street, as you, as you go north on 35th from Happy Valley. It takes a jog to the east. Again, I, I don't know the name of that community. Reardon Ranch is one of the developments in there. Uh, the other uh, segment of the community that has a name is Arizona something. But they have two infill developments that they are now dealing with, and those infill develop developments will put some 80 new homes in that uh, rather small area. And I don't know, again, if that area has Sandra Day O'Connor as its attendance. Uh, that's not on your radar screen. Yet. Yeah, we, we have a lot of those developed throughout the district, but you are correct in that you need to um, invite your friends to the O'Connor High School um, to voice their concerns, because that's actually how the process works. So you're correct. So right. thanks for coming. Right. Appreciate okay. it. Uh, one other question, even if I am over time, does, does the school district typically take it? A position on matters like oh this? we do not no nope. we, we we just rent out our facility to because we want our uh, no, no, our I facilities mean, I mean to be the I mean, center I mean on, of the, community, on, the, on the proposal the whole process no we don't no. we don't no we don't we, do, we we're not allowed to give our thumbs up or down well sorry for going over time well, thanks for, thanks for coming time if you want. appreciate it Consent agenda. I move that the governing board approve consent agenda items 5A through 5O. I second. All those in favor say. Oh. It's just going on 5A instead of doing the whole thing. Well, it yeah. says 5A through 5O right, on there. Right, it'll go, it'll go through it. Yeah. Yeah. All, the, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Moving on to 6A. I did. Oh. Um. All right, it says that I've been kicked out. We will not kick you out. <laughs> if, <laughs> um, if, okay, well, I guess. Okay, appreciate that. I move that the governing board approve all employee out of state travel per governing board policy GCCE. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No op there's no it's for nothing. So we're we're good on that. Let's go to six B. I move that the governing board approve the superintendent's two thousand nineteen twenty performance pay goals. I second. Oh, I second. Any discussion? Looks like Mrs. Tweedy has discussion. I just had a question that was brought to my attention. Um now that we're on, on the um fiscal responsibility portion where it's um I don't have it up right in front of me, but the part where we compare oh, ourselves for you. Right oh, okay. Okay, on the district spending report, I didn't realize I wasn't thinking about it, but then it was brought to my attention that this has already occurred, right? This spending, it's not spending we'll do this year. Like it's a year behind, or am I wrong? I just, that was brought to my attention. When it's reported, yeah, I don't know. Mr. M. Or Ms. Uh, President Ordway, members of the board, Dr. Fitch, yes. So that is going to be uh, after the fact, if you will. The, the report from the Auditor General does not come out until typically the end of February for the previous fiscal year that ended June 30th. So I guess does it make sense to have a goal on something that's already actually happened? We just don't have the report? Remember, we had this discussion about some of my goals will be don't follow a, a school calendar. Some will follow a 
traditional calendar. Some will follow a reporting calendar. So, um, yeah, we, we, we arm wrestled over this already. Uh, but the, the point was, the theory was that I would be here longer than one year. And that every year that it would keep occurring, I would be responsible in, in per perpetuity. So I, I didn't mean it. That is I a mean, theory. But. I mean, whether or not we were... No, I, I, I didn't mean... It'll be reported. What yeah. I guess I was saying is you weren't actually... I don't want... Well, that, I know what you're saying. I, I didn't want to say you're not doing anything. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Well, I know what you're... I, know what you're, but when we I don't a, know what you're thinking, but I know what you're saying. What yes. I'm trying to say, and it's yeah. not coming out eloquent. No, I hear you. You won't be actually doing anything on this goal this year. You're just waiting for a report to come out. Correct. And hopefully the goal will be continued the next year, and so I'll be working on it this year for next year. It's some parts of actually throughout the whole all of my superintendent goals they are um, they come in at different times so you are correct but he is always working always working on, on that aspect of it right yeah, no yeah. no no i didn't no i know what you're saying but i'm gonna take a year but, off i think and <laughs> we're just gonna not spend any money no no i i know what you're trying to say though because of the time because we did wrestle over because these because it's literally already been done correct oh, well the work's been done but the uh, you're reporting. working towards next year correct okay but, correct but the information is always slow to come. So it's usually one year behind or eight months behind. Yeah, yeah. So as, as we approve your goals, we make sure that they're aligned to whatever those goals are. So we're not waiting or going, well, yeah, you did good, but we don't really have the information. So that was our whole, <coughs> when we decided on that, that was what the collective board decided that made sense because we're actually using authentic information. I, I guess it just didn't, I wasn't thinking about oh, that all right. the spending had yep. already occurred, yep. Yep. That, yep. that he won't be. But you, you'll keep this goal next year. Correct. So you're still going to be on the hook for any spending you're Correct. doing this year. Correct. Okay, that's what I'm yep. trying to say. Okay. Yeah, the theory was that I was going to stick around longer than one calendar year. Okay. That was the theory. <laughs> but that is a theory. And yes, Tuesday night, I could be fired. So just to clarify for if we have other community members or parents that are or teachers that are watching, um, when we were – going through the superintendent's goals and doing his evaluation, there there was information that we were missing in order to um, determine whether or not Dr. Finch had met parts of his goals, specifically the A, you know, one of the things, the A and B ratings for the schools, because we don't get those until the fall, but we have to have his evaluation done in June. So when we were trying to write new goals to make sure they were SMART goals, we were trying to make sure we captured all of the information throughout the, the whole year, the, not just a fiscal year, not just a reporting year, but looking at things more holistically. So um, he might achieve some of his goals in October and he might achieve some of his goals in February and they just continue to roll. So if he achieves his goal in October, the next day he starts working on the goal for the following year. So he's always so like so he's always working. He's always interesting? yeah. So what so yeah. what Miss Tweedy was trying to get at he's always he's always doing something, but um, and he's always working towards those goals. And some of these goals don't necessarily change year to year. We're trying to make sure that they're all tied to the strategic plan because the strategic plan leads the district. Our our governing board goals are now tied to the strategic plan. Everything's tied to the strategic plan. So we're all moving forward the same way as a district. Yep. Awesome. Right? Yep. And they're smart goals. So, which is why we have to have the information that slowly lags from right, right. places. It allows us to, to have a smart goal. Right. It allows us to truly determine whether we've met the goals as opposed to it being op opinion based or subjective. It's objective instead of subjective. Yep. Anyway. Good question. Though. Excellent. So, are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I don't see anyone that has opposed it, so there are no, no opposition. Um, and now go to 6C. Oh. I move that the governing board approve professional travel for a superintendent to attend the AASA National Conference on Education in San Diego, California, February 13th through 15th, 2020. And that would be the American Association of School Administrators. Very good. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
I move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to pre-approve the addenda as presented. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Well, we have a 6E, and I think we're probably going to have some discussion, so let's get it. I move that the governing board approve the guaranteed maximum price number one in the amount of $16,565,021 for the construction of new elementary school number 31 to Chase Building Team using the construction manager, excuse me, construction manager at risk methodology. I second. And Ms. Miglarino, if you would like to give us something that does not include Jim Font, we are happy to hear from you. Well, no promises about the Jim Font, but uh, President Hordeway, members of the board, Dr. Finch, um, I uh, intend to be uh, somewhat brief because I know that uh, much of this is a little bit refresher, at least the first uh, portion of this. Uh, we are excited about this opportunity. This has been a um, long uh, road to get to this point, um, but uh, we are uh, embarking on um, pending your decision tonight, uh, the, the start of constructing another elementary school in our district. Um, to provide a little bit of background, um, the USAA property, which was a full section of land, uh, was originally designed to be um, a USAA complex, a regional complex for them, and uh, they made a decision that they weren't going to expand it any more than it has grown to uh, at its current state, so they're in the process of developing the balance of the project. Uh, we <coughs> got involved with them uh, during that uh, rezoning application with the city of Phoenix uh, and ended up with a, uh, an option for a school site inside the development. Uh, it's approximately 1,200 single family homes and another 800 multifamily units uh, and some mixed use as well um, uh, as part of that. Uh, there, will be some, there will be some commercial development along the Happy Valley Corridor as well. This is kind of what the um, overlay looks like. Uh, what you see uh, in terms of the first development is phase one. Um, the colored shaded areas are the additional phases beyond uh, phase one. They are already working on those phases as we speak. Um, I would say that the home sales have been pretty robust uh, to this point. Um, I think they've exceeded their expectations. Um, this is our uh, demographers report uh, to kind of let you know that uh, the area that you see right above the I-17 uh, uh, insignia for the um, for the freeway is uh, close to the proximity of the USAA uh, location. All of that red shading there is uh, on that heat map is showing where there is high growth of student um, in this particular area. Um, and uh, you can see that we're projecting about 1,125 additional students in the next five years uh, in that region that we refer to as east of I-17, north of Happy Valley, and south of Carefree Highway. <laughs> um, here are the schools and the projections for the schools. Um, the orange shading there is when we've exceeded the 100% capacity. Uh, yellow is when we're approaching uh, capacity, exceeding 90%, and blue, uh, meaning that we are below 50% uh, of the capacity of the school. Uh, just as a reminder, Desert Mountain was built as a middle school. It's a rather large campus uh, and has capacity for uh, over 1,300 students. Um, <clears throat> but you can see uh, the total number of students in that region we will not be able to accommodate um, in the very near future. Um, so. Um, this is obviously the Reader's Digest version, but we did approve a land exchange in January of 2019 to trade some land that we own at uh, 43rd Avenue, near 43rd Avenue in Alameda. Uh, was designated to be a school site um, at some point in time. I think it was acquired in the mid-80s. <coughs> uh, obviously, we haven't developed it. Uh, it's raw land. We have no plans to develop on that site. Uh, so we proposed trading them that land for land in the uh, Union Park uh, development, um, and uh, a land exchange agreement was crafted. It had some commitments in it that at the 100th home closing we had to be uh, in design, at the 200 home closing we'd have to start construction. They're somewhere between 100 and 200 homes today um, with, uh, with the sales. And uh, the land exchange is moving through the process. We do expect to be able to close on that land exchange 
um, uh, towards the end of this month, uh, uh, the month of August. There were ever other provisions inside the, the land exchange uh, agreement, but um, uh, you know that was something that, that's been approved, so I won't get into any more of the details. But with the land exchange uh, uh, approved on the, at the January 8th meeting, on February 26th, you, you approved the architect uh, to design the school. Um, we approved the pre-construction uh, services contract with Chase on May 28th. And we submitted the plans to the City of Phoenix uh, for the permitting process at the end of June. Um, as I mentioned, the land exchange is tentatively scheduled to close at the end of August, uh, where we would then own the site. Uh, and tonight we're considering uh, GMP number one, and I'm going to speak about that in just a moment. Um, but uh, that's being considered uh, this evening. Uh, construction plan to begin early September, and the timeline that we have is uh, we can complete the school uh, by June of 2020 to open for August of 2020 for the 2020-21 year uh, school year. Just a quick site overlay um, of the of the campus. Uh, this parcel is has some unique characteristics to it, uh, so we are uh, having to create a two-story classroom design. Um, but it is just over 83,500 square feet, um, and it has all of the amenities that we would uh, have at a typical K-8 campus, um, capable of uh, service uh, serving just over 900 students um, at SFB capacity uh, standards. Just a couple renderings of what the project. Uh, uh, looks like from the architect. Uh, this is kind of just an overview. Um, this would be the front entrance uh, off to the left. Uh, uh, to the right side of this picture is the uh, administration building. To the left is the uh, multi-purpose building. Um, you're looking in the corridor here at the two-story classroom building. Uh, off to the right in the shade structure with the playground equipment would be the kindergarten play area. Um, we have additional renderings, but just in the interest of time, um, I'll, I'll just be brief with that. Uh, we did allocate $17 million uh, for this particular budget, 16.5 of that from the 2013 bond authorization. Uh, and these are the construction budgets, I should say. Half a million dollars in adjacent ways uh, authorization uh, with the, the GMP that's being considered along with a direct contract that we do for fire security uh, in order to standardize those systems uh, throughout the district. Uh, it is exactly $17 million. The reason for that is Chase building team um, decided to make a concession uh, for some of their fees to be able to get this within the GMP budget. Uh, we did have to make some scope changes as well. Uh, the half a million dollars worth of adjacent ways is actually over $656,000 in actual costs. Um, but that will be absorbed into the GMP number. So uh, unless the, the board would be inter interested in entertaining a future approval of adjacent ways, which we wouldn't be able to do until uh, June of 2020. So um, that would be uh, off into the future. Some of the major exclusions that we had to do to get this within the budget, uh, the metal canopies that, uh, that, that you saw in the center of the campus and over at the kindergarten drop-off area uh, had to be eliminated. Um, uh, and we had to change the ornamental wrought iron perimeter fence to, to chain link. Um, what I think is worth noting here is we have been in discussions with uh, USAA, and their, uh, which is the parent company, and US RELP is the, uh, the development division, our real estate division of, of USAA. Um, and they are interested in contributing financially to the project to be able to reinstate some of these exclusions. Uh, so we would bring back to the governing board uh, an additional GMP. That's why we're naming this one GMP number one. There would be a, uh, at least a GMP number two uh, pending uh, an agreement that we can work out for them to be able to uh, also financially contribute to, to the project to put back some of the exclusions that we had included or, or had to um, were forced to put in to be able to fit it within the budget that we had allocated. Um, and so that's really uh, the long and short of it. There would be a groundbreaking ceremony that, um, that of course, the board uh, that would still needs to be coordinated. That would be sometime, um, hopefully, September might even be a little bit cooler, or maybe we'll schedule it early enough in the morning uh, so that uh, um, uh, uh, it won't be as hot. Don't uh, burn your hand on the shovel. That would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, and so there's a, a, a lot of other events that need to take place as, as part of this, but this is the first step in the process towards um, actually um, starting all of the wheels in motion uh, to be able to have this school constructed for the 2021 school year. Any questions? Mrs. Reed. Um, just a question that I've been asked a few times by some parents is um, I know that w we, the architect, picks out certain colors for the school um, and then we allow the, the parent group, the community group, um, to put a committee together and pick out the school colors and the mascot and, and name the school. Um, at what point do we order the colors of everything? to see whether or not it, it can be more compatible with already branding the school and kind of be similar color. Does that make sense? Did I ask that question appropriately? Like Sonoran Foothills, which was the last school we opened, has a copper um, theatrical curtain across the stage, but the community group decided that our color should be um, cobalt blue, black, and gray. So, um, and then in order to replace some of those to make it branding wise to match it's additional money that the school is having to pay so is, is there a point that we pull the trigger on ordering all of those things in certain colors that we might be able to avoid and have more of a branding with the school colors that are chosen or are those already set in stone uh, so president ordway uh, miss reed uh, i guess it depends on which colors you're referring to so uh, you know a piece of equipment um, like the uh, curtains or divider um, probably don't ha doesn't have as much of a long lead time as some of more specialized equipment for this uh, for the school Correct. Um, and the block and the exterior colors it's integral color block uh, that's being specced so those colors are already established um, and that was also part of the process in the land exchange agreement to get USAA's uh, comments on color renderings because it's going to be adjacent to their um, to their complex. So the the exterior colors that you saw um, are already selected and approved by all the people that uh, had to approve it. But certain equipment in that. Um, we would need to know probably just because of the lead time on ordering things, probably just after the end of the calendar year, I would say early in January. Okay. Um, and so it just depends on how soon some of those decisions can be made so, through the processes. So that. what you're talking about is the timing of having the name, mascot, and colors picked in time for whatever that those things are that can be ordered to match a new school color or mascot. So we just need to figure out what traditionally when when that timing is and make sure it's compatible is that correct yes that's that's can we dr what finch I'm can, to... we, can we figure that out well the good news is we have that we have all that in calendarized um okay. all those different events that occur when you open a school so we kept our footnotes from some more foothills and so we have all that um, well, calendarized right but obviously it's, it's being yeah. compressed uh, because of right. time so um and that's what mr rigorino is referring to is um, some of this will be accelerated because of we were trying to pull that school forward. So it will be in the process and will probably be pulled together, obviously, pre January, it sounded like. So, it, uh, what um, Mrs. Reed is referring to is that we move that process, if possible, of the naming of the school up far enough so it will match the other accelerated part of what we're accelerating. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. I just part of the problem, though, is that community doesn't exist. Correct. So um, that square mile will be in process. So um, they'll they'll be building the homes and may only have fifty residents. Right. That so are actually living there. So yeah, it'll be we'll have to be creative on how we bring that right. together. Well, I know that when they when they were doing with the Norton Foothills, they pulled kids from True. the schools that were that's probably what we'll into, do as well. into the campus and. Yep. We'll have to get creative. But. So however that magic bag of tricks is going to work, we just would like it to be in a process prior to the acceleration of Jim having to do all that other stuff. Okay. Thank yep, you. Thanks. Were we going somewhere with this? Oh, yeah, we're going to vote on that. So all those in favor, say aye. 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 aye.
Any opposed? Did you already vote? Oh, we're waiting for Ms. Reed. Okay. So there's no opposed. Okay. 4 0. So let's move on to discussion items. We are going to discuss the draft that we all received in the Friday update um, that we were all part of, um, giving our information. So uh, the board goals, I don't know how we want to do this. Do you want to start one at a time? Or? I was going to make Jenny, um, Jenny had to leave the state because she had a family emergency. Um, because the goals are written at 100%. I would just wonder if we could discuss this at the next meeting because Ms. Frank will be back. Her, sure. her, she had. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. We not, could. Not do you want to discuss it now and then again so we can make tweaks in between, or you want to wait till then? I'd rather do it one, one time. time. One time. One I was time thinking is that too. A good time. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. So we will do that. Um, and we can move on to the ASBA political agenda. Did anyone have any uh, priorities that they didn't see in there? Or I thought it looked great. So, Mrs. Reed, you are our delegate, correct? Yes. Sweetie, you're good with O'Brien? Yeah, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in the past we've... Do we vote that we agreed with this? Well, we will. I just wanted to next see meeting. If we okay, I'm just. I was I just, just making sure that we're. This is just a discussion item, but I want to make sure that we're agreeing yep. now. We vote and next. And if anything pops in our heads, we can do that. But for the most part, what we've read is is what we agree with, which is what we'll send you with, if Correct. approved at the next and, meeting. And since uh, Miss Tweedy isn't, or I'm sorry, Miss um, Frank isn't here. We could just make sure anything that she wants to add, right? Yeah. That, that I don't. I don't. Get sent I, out. I haven't gotten anything, and I don't think anyone else has gotten anything. So perhaps I want to make sure. Okay. So now we'll go to discussion item: fall staffing. Discussion item: fall staffing. Fall staffing. Who, who are we going to discuss that with? That, that was uh, Ms. Moffat. That be Moffitt. Ms. Moffat? Yep. She was going to do um, answer any questions that you might have on the process of how we because um, that's all every every time this time of year we get those types of questions. Is so, this a board that has questions on yeah. fall staffing? It sure yeah. is. Ms. So Tudy, she can tell you the process that we go through. I know you do. Go ahead. She wants us to jump. Okay, in. so to the schools who are um, at or over their numbers, when will they be receiving extra teachers? Um, so President Ordway, Ms. Tweedy, some of them already have. We begin um, addressing fall staffing in late July. We begin to look at power schools, but we know it's not 100% accurate because our registrars are not back and they're not taking out um, numbers yet or adding in whoever may be at their doorstep. But if we see something that is quite significant, we start calling administration and we start staffing, and we have done that. Um, we also are making phone calls pretty much on a daily basis or emailing campuses on a daily basis to let them know when we might be providing some staffing for them. We can't give them a definitive time always. Um, uh, so I'll give you an example. I, ha I had a conversation with a campus today that is quite over in the area of kindergarten. And we are not confident that we're going to have a kindergarten teacher to surplus in their direction, but we're waiting because there are some campuses that are close and we don't want to pull that staffing too early. We're not yet at the 10th student day. So we're watching. So we're building two timelines for that campus. One timeline would be for surplus and the other one would be if there is no surplus, how do we prepare to begin staffing that location prepare a substitute and communication to the community. So how many schools are in that position right now with classes that are over? That are over. A lot. Um, 
11 sections right now are over. S most of those are one student over. We have a couple that are two students over. Those sections won't likely qualify for a teacher. Those sections will qualify for aid time. And we will watch them following that formula. There are some sections, though, that will likely qualify for a teacher. Um, and that, that is within the 11. We only have six sections that are under right now, and some of those are very close, so we may not have six people to surplus. We think we may solidly have four that we will be surplusing into the open areas, and then we will go from there. Does that mean you'll post the position yes. and try to hire? If the position does qualify for a teacher, um, then we would be creating a, a new section, finding a location for that um, classroom to be, finding a substitute to hold the fort down until we were able to staff it. Yes. Okay, this, this is kind of staffing, but so we have all, we have schools that definitely have more students than fit in our buildings and yes. they're bulging which means that we would have to staff for another section of whether it be kindergarten or whatever the grade level. So what are our plans for those campuses that are overcrowded kid-wise but have teachers? And so what are we going to be doing with them? A and, and the concerns that come up are they start having lunch at 10 o'clock and then they end having lunch at 2 o'clock. So staffing, but kind of sort of close to it? Yeah, President Ordway, I hear two things in your question. So the first one is what do we do when there is no physical capacity for a new section? I think I heard that question. It doesn't happen very often, but it has happened. And so most of the time, the campus will opt for a full-time aid and the aid will be there to help the grade level in whatever way the grade level finds to be most helpful to them, and they are there for the entire year because they don't have the physical capacity to open up an, an entirely new section. Um, again, that is very rare because we do try to use all physical spaces. We've had some yes. campuses sh um, open up sections of the library in, well, into a classroom for a time being. Well, I know used their offices too, so. The other part of that is the complication of adding sections when you've already completed your master schedule. And Mirage would be an example of that. Um, their kindergarten came in so very high this year that they have already created a section um, before the school year began and added kindergarten, which filled up their special areas schedule and we needed to add more FTE for them in order to accommodate and they did have to rearrange their schedule and um, redesign when students were going to be going to their special areas. And sometimes that can cause the lunch schedule to be altered, but most of the time not, because when we build a lunch schedule, we design it for grade levels to come in. And if you add a kindergarten section, you, they usually can fit into the cafeteria at the same time. I'm just saying it's it's hard to to have lunch at 10:30 because you it can just be. got there and it's also difficult for the kids to have lunch at 2:30 because now they've been there all day and they didn't eat their breakfast. Just saying, but anyway, so you keep an eye on that. Yes, we assist in helping build schedules that um, are the best option, and sometimes when it gets a little bit too challenging, we provide more support and supervision of students at the lunch time and at the playground time. Ms. Moffat, would you be able to explain um, what triggers another section or what triggers another employee? So um, I, I think that you would be able to explain it the best way and use the correct verbiage for um, everybody to hear. I know parents are, are concerned because their class sizes are a little bit high and they keep, you know, uh, I think there's some inaccurate information that, that floats out as far as how many kids over it needs to be and how long it needs to be held and, and that. And we want to make sure that um, that everybody understands and all the same verbiage is being used. So, Ms. Reed, um, President Ordway, 
when we are in fall staffing time, I'm going to back into the summer again. We, we do have a little bit more flexibility in the summertime to look for those high areas again where there are a lot of students or when we're looking at a campus that has seen both through our own experience and through our demographer, our demographer is telling us that that campus is going to continue to see um, increased enrollment. Sonoran Foothills would be an example. When we know that there are many people at a rapid speed moving into the area, we will add a section very quickly. When we see that they are already over, that they have many students on an open enrollment wait list, um, we will go ahead and add a section. So we will not necessarily be so strict to the formula because we know that they are coming. But your question was the formula. So when it comes fall staffing time, and we are past the first student day, we look first for grade levels that um, are over, let's say three sections, we have three sections of third grade. Each classroom would need to be two students over, with one of those classrooms being three students over. At that point, we would be staffing a teacher or sending surplus. Under that, we are monitoring up to three weeks for aid time. An aid time is deployed at four hours, typically, for the grade level. Kindergarten would be an exception. We changed that formula about four years ago, where each kindergarten teacher receives an hour and 15 minutes of aid time. They requested that because kindergarten students are new. They felt that they needed more support for transitions. There are exceptions to those rules. Again, one of those would be the rapidly growing campuses. Campuses that have a long wait list on their open enrollment list, and we can add stack students on top of that overage already. We can add a section. Um, Budget-wise, what we're really looking for is around 10 students. If we can get 10 additional students, we are financially able to take on that cost doesn't always happen that way, um, but that's our general rule. That's kind of what we are shooting for. So if we only have, yeah, I know you mentioned three sections of third grade. What if there was only two sections of third grade? It's the same rule. Okay. So th each section of third grade, if only two, would need one would need to be over by two. The other one would need to be over by three, and then we'd be looking at a teacher. Now that's outside of surplus time. There have been years when we have enough surplus to fill sections that are just a few students over. But in this year's case, we don't have as much surplus. Thank you. Mrs. O'Brien. With those numbers or the example you gave with the third grade, grade class, um, is there a hard or fast rule about how many days they have to hold those numbers? Or is it depend upon the campus and, and what you're seeing at each individual campus? After surplus time, so surplus time for us is really into the third week of school, okay. but it doesn't prevent us from monitoring um, the amount of time a section has held. But what we're looking for is, is three weeks. If the campus has held that number for three weeks, I bring those numbers into cabinet every single Monday Cabinet reviews them, and Cabinet approves either the addition of a teacher or an aide based on that formula. And, it, and they do it sooner during the surplus time. Okay, that makes sense. And you said in the campuses where we um, maybe don't have the physical capacity, which I know occurred at Stetson Hills back in, in my day, um, that is that message communicated out to your families when the decision has been made to have an aid as opposed to um, being able to have that additional section so that the families understand why, why, what the decision is and why that decision was made? Ms. O'Brien, the communication, um, the responsibility of the communication is at the campus. We provide guidance on what does need to occur. There is communication when a teacher is added and we do have bullet points that we follow as far as that communication is concerned. As far as aid time goes, I, I know that our principals will communicate if the community is concerned about the overage. 
we do have locations where the concern is not as heightened and so the communication is probably not necessary with the exception of just introducing somebody new that's going to maybe be interfacing with their students. Okay, thank you. Ms. Tweedy. I had two more questions. The first, um, how many positions do we still have vacant that weren't filled for this school year? Ms. Tweedy, in, um, in our K-8, configurations we have 4.5 special education vacancies these are not actual vacancies these are FTE total FTE um, so in other words to make up that 4.5 there could be more postings because we could have 0.5s within that in that FTE we also have a 0.5 music position posted in our K6 campuses we have nine special education postings and one reading specialist posting in our middle grades, one special education posting. Our high school, one special education posting. And 5.5 gen ed postings. So are, are you, to cover those, um, all those special education, are you using contract, are those kids, do we have all the minutes covered on the IEPs for all the students with all those openings? Um, we did open the, the first day with our special education vacancies covered. Some of them are covered with contract teachers. Some of them are covered with guest instructors. Others with special education, I'm sorry, uh, substitutes, long-term substitutes. And in each of those scenarios, Student Support Services and HR works with the campuses and with the CES to make sure that we are covered as far as IEPs are concerned. Does it, uh, does it mean that things don't start to arise? They did this week. A substitute doesn't come in or a contract um, employee decides that they don't want to be a contract employee any longer and so we have to put a new plan in place. And we're actively doing that on a daily basis. And then, the, I'm sorry, the last thing. Um, when you look at classrooms that are over, are you looking at high schools too? In, so for um, clarification, yes, we are looking at their enrollment. And we did allocate additional FTE to both O'Connor and Mountain Ridge because their enrollment came in high. But I think your question is, um, Classrooms yes, I'm already hearing stories, I, I guess. I have 35 students in my ELA class or my math class. I'm hearing individual stories. So are those situations being monitored? We HR does not monitor classroom sizes at, at high school. We monitor the appropriate amount of FTE allocated so that their contacts are, are appropriate because the certified manual says how many contacts a teacher is allowed to have in 7th through 12th grade. The certified manual also says that classrooms should be around a certain number and when the, it's not, our administration and counseling team should be working with the staff to try and balance those classrooms out. We do rely on our campuses to reach out to us when they're having uh, difficulty balancing and they need some support or some staffing support to balance those out. I, Maria, I know, d um, works on those things quite often too because those concerns reach the reps and those reps reach out to Maria. So Maria and I discuss those areas as well. So that's another way it comes to HR. I, I don't want to hold everyone tonight, but maybe it would be a future discussion because I hear a lot of instances from parents and teachers, and it's usually at the high school level, okay. and, it, and it could be a scheduling issue where they have to overload because there's not an elective offered. But there's a lot of high school classes that have 35, 36, and it's very hard to teach. So I, I don't know what the answer is, and maybe it goes as a new discussion item because. Well, maybe when we get the, the um, actual numbers in, um, and we could deal with the uh, true numbers, then we can figure out what it is that we need to discuss because you're hearing something, I'm hearing something else, everybody's hearing something, but once we get the actual numbers in, and the uh, some teachers like 45 kids in their rooms because it, it move, you know, they move, others don't. So once we get the actual numbers, then we could yeah. see and I how think that works. To reemphasize Miss Moffat's point too is that it's built on contact. So you might have 35 in the first hour and is have it 180 seven in your or second hour. 
What is what is high school now? Are we at 180 or 170? What's the contact number? Uh, one seven. Maria, do you know off the top of your head? One seventy. Just one seventy. One seventy. Okay. So I did want to go backwards though to uh, the vacancies in the special ed. I wanted to make sure that um, the minutes in the IEPs, the accommodations and modifications in the 504s and the IEPs are being covered, no matter whether we have whomever's in there. We're making sure that that's taking place. Correct. Yes. We, yes. Okay. We are. I just want. I just wanted to clarify that. Anything else? I think um, on, from a, from the good side, we are better staffed than we were last year at this time. So it, that, that's the good news. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, but um, uh, same with um, in the classified world. That That's a celebration as well. An additional celebration, um, Ernie let us know in transportation that they had all routes covered nice on the first day, plus two standby drivers. Yeah, I know. Jim, could you please sing the wheels of the bus go around since transportation is still yours? <laughs> Mrs. Reed? Um, just to follow up on um, the discussion about class sizes and to bring it back to one of the discussions that we had um, in the spring was about looking at putting a committee together to discuss class sizes and um, see where we could lower some of those um, because I think some of them were a little bit more dependent, uh, like in high school, um, looking at some of the ways that we could lower class sizes in, in certain areas. Um, so I just want to, to bring that up and, and hopefully we can get some more discussion on that and get that going. Um, and then Ms. Moffat, there was one other issue that came up over the last couple of weeks with, um, teachers starting the school year off in the classroom and not being approved, um, by the board at the first board meeting. So if you wouldn't mind spending just a, a quick minute explaining that process and um, why that's an adopted policy with, within school HR, mm -hmm. please. So it is very common um, across districts for us to start employees prior to board approval. And the reason that is is because um, some districts have one board meeting a month. We have a, two board meetings a month, so around every two, you, you all know that, around every two yes. weeks we come together and you have the opportunity to um, approve HR changes. And we don't wanna hold our candidates off two weeks before they start to work and that is pretty much why that practice is in place. Employment is only legally binding when you approve it. So they may sign a contract, they may sign a letter of intent, they may begin work, but their actual employment does not become legal until you do approve it. So um, legalities, that part matters, but because that is true, we, we can start them earlier and still be okay. Thank you. Sorry, one more. Why be sorry, Mrs. O'Brien, go ahead. I, I just wanna go back because we were talking about the high school uh, class sizes, when you do the math on the 170 touches, if a, a typical high school teacher has five sections, that is about 34 students in a classroom. So to say that they have 35 in a high school classroom is not necessarily um, a, a lot of extra when we're talking about touches. And so as Dr. Finch was saying you might have 40 in one and 30 in another as long as we're hitting our 170 and, and not getting too out of line. You don't necessarily want to have 70 in one, but I do think that that math is important to know that about 35 is correct. Thank you. Yeah, and I think um, to go on Ms. Reed's point too, um, I, other districts have, I'm again stealing some of their ideas, but another district had an idea of putting a committee together to talk about the, the ones that are, um, are typically uh, problem cases for us. And maybe you've designed some kind of incentive program. I mean, I mean the futures report even talked about that. Maybe in our special education world, we can um, have more incentive to work at campus A, B, or C with some financial interests and maybe some more perks along that line, training or whatever. And there are other districts that do that. So that was, um, I like that idea. And that's something that we're going to engage uh, with this year. I, I just like want to correct you. We don't steal, we liberate, and we, we liberate. share. So. I, I would just like to say too, I mean, I mean, you know, and I think that's where the committee comes in. We're operating under the assumption 35 is reasonable. I know as a math teacher and I know other math teachers, 
when you have 35 students low at math and you try to help them all at once, I, I would challenge the people that think that's reasonable to get out there and teach a math lesson to 35 middle schoolers or high schoolers and just see how reasonable you really think it is. Yeah, we do have, um, that's a good point. We do actually get the actual numbers and then we, like we had those last year and we looked at the actual numbers that were over in the actual, um, uh, the data. So once we have the real numbers, that'll make our discussion a little more fruitful. On that note, Mrs. O'Brien. I move to adjourn the meeting. I second. All those in, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.